Well, hello and thank you for joining me. Wow, Palm Sunday, the beginning of Holy Week. A time to remember our Lord's last eight days with us until his return. A time of great joy, deep sorrow, ending with an amazing promise. A perfect time to reflect on our humanity, both now and on that first Palm Sunday as we shout Hosanna in the highest. But first, let's pray, because we can't do this without God. Father God, as we consider your word today, we ask that through the power of your Holy Spirit, you will guide us. And may these words of my mouth and this meditation of our hearts be pleasing in your sight, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. For we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Today's scripture is taken from the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 21, verses 1 through 9. I'll be reading from the 1984 New International Version. Please follow along in your own Bible, Matthew 21, 1 through 9. So let us hear the word of God. As they approached Jerusalem and came to Bethpage on the Mount of Olives, Jesus sent two disciples, saying to them, Go to the village ahead of you, and at once you will find a donkey tied there with her colt by her. Untie them and bring them to me. If anyone says anything to you, tell them that the Lord needs them, and he will send them right away. And this took place to fulfill what was spoken through the prophet. Say to the daughter of Zion, See, your king comes to you, gentle and riding on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a donkey. The disciples went and did as Jesus had instructed them. They brought the donkey and the colt, placed their cloaks on them, and Jesus sat on them. A very large crowd spread their cloaks on the road, while others cut branches from the trees and spread them on the road. The crowds that went ahead of him and those that followed him shouted, Hosanna to the son of David. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. This is the word of God. Praise and thanks be to God. Now, most Bible translations use the caption, the triumphal entry. And truly, what a wonderful day that must have been. How exhilarating it must have been for the disciples as they followed Jesus. Initially, they were apprehensive to return to Jerusalem, for good reason. Concerned for Jesus' safety, but now... How exciting it must have been for them. There were people lining the streets as Jesus rode by, laying their very own robes on the roadway, scurrying about to cut palms to lay in Jesus' path, shouting hosannas. Can you imagine the excitement in the air? What a thrill this was for the disciples, seeing their teacher, their leader, their companion of three years being welcomed this way. Uh, it had to have been overwhelming. I would have loved to have been there. How about you? This is what I imagine it will be like for us as we reach heaven's gate. I believe this is the kind of excitement we will experience as the angels sing and we are welcomed into eternity, back to the garden. A joy we will have for all eternity as God's promises are fulfilled. I believe that is when we will truly be able to understand fully the impact of that first Palm Sunday, not only on the disciples, but on the Jews who were expecting their deliverer. As they came from every corner of the kingdom to celebrate Passover, a time to remember and celebrate their deliverance from slavery in Egypt. Now I'm confident that these disciples, these throngs of people, were not celebrating the truth and hope of a kingdom to come. Many were excited because of who they understood Jesus to be, who they wanted their Messiah, their Deliverer, to be. And many were excited because they believed Jesus was the man, the man who would free them from Roman oppression. They believed he would restore Israel to the great nation it once was. He's going to throw these Romans out, they thought, He's not going, to, not only that, he's going to send these Romans back to Rome never to return again. And they were laying their robes down in front of him because that's what you did for a returning king. 
And certainly that part of it, they had right. Jesus was their returning king, just not the way they thought their king would return. But let's not lose sight of the whole truth. There were a number of folks, powerful people, that were not excited. They too didn't understand who Jesus was and what was about to happen, being influenced by the most devious of adversaries. Consider our world today, this Palm Sunday. There are still very powerful people refusing to hear the truth, being deceived by that very same adversary opposing the gospel of truth. So why all this confusion? How is it pretty much no one understood then, and many still refuse to recognize the light even today? Isn't Jesus clear? Wasn't he clear? Didn't he tell them who he was and what he was about to do for all of us? As we meditate on that thought, let's consider what we are told in the Gospel of John, chapter 12, verses 1 through 11, which gives us a look into the environment around Jesus as he was approaching his last week on earth. Perhaps we will see some similarity surrounding us today. Six days before the Passover, Jesus came to Bethany, where Lazarus lived, whom Jesus had raised from the dead. Here a dinner was given in Jesus' honor. Mary served while Lazarus was among those reclining at the table with him. Now here we see Jesus being honored at the home of dear friends, with his closest followers, and, and I imagine a great deal of anticipation over his return to Jerusalem. Today, as many followers of Jesus gather and celebrate with the same excitement, anticipating our Savior's triumphant return. Then Mary took about a pint of pure nard, an expensive perfume. She poured it on Jesus' feet and wiped his feet with her hair, and the house was filled with the fragrance of the perfume. This is where it gets a bit sad. Mary takes her most prized possession and lovingly anoints Jesus. Can't we just feel the love as the aroma of this precious oil fills the room? This was the most intimate of gestures because women did not let their hair down other than in the presence of family and never in a public venue. If we had been there, wouldn't we have felt the love how could we not? But one of his disciples, Judas Iscariot, who was later to betray him, objected. Why wasn't this perfume sold and the money given to the poor? It was worth a year's wages. And he did not say this because he cared about the poor, but because he was a thief. As keeper of the money bag, he used to help himself to whatever was put into it. Why would Judas react so negatively? Well, the scripture tells us because he was a thief desiring more money to pilfer. But let me suggest he was already lured by the enemy with thoughts of power and wealth. The enemy, Satan, was already influencing Judas. So very sad. Especially when we hear, leave her alone, Jesus replied. It was intended that she should save this perfume for the day of my burial. You will always have the poor among you, but you will not always have me. The question I ask here is whether or not Mary understood that Jesus was about to die, or did she see this as a kingly anointing? Probably the latter, coupled with a demonstration of her love for Jesus. Just to touch on it, was Jesus being dismissive of the poor? Of course not. He had spoken of caring for the poor on far too many occasions to even consider that. He was, yet again, trying to have them understand what was about to happen. He was going to be leaving. Meanwhile, a large crowd of Jews found out that Jesus was there and came, not only because of him, 
but also to see Lazarus, whom he had raised from the dead. Looking for another miracle. Jesus' reputation was growing, and many who had heard of Lazarus' miraculously being raised from the dead after four days in the grave wanted to see him for themselves, confirmation, so to speak. But not everyone was curious because they wanted to follow Jesus. So the chief priests made plans to kill Lazarus as well. See, they had already made plans to kill Jesus. For on account of him, many Jews were going over to Jesus and believing in him. See, not much has changed in the world today. Wouldn't you agree? As we celebrate that triumphal entry, as we proclaim Hosanna in the highest, do we understand the enemy is still very much at work? It may help to look again at those who were first-hand witnesses. They needed to see the risen Christ before they understood. So let's ask again. Wasn't Jesus clear? We know he was. On more than one occasion, he told them who he was. On more than one occasion, he told them why he had come. Now, if we back up a little bit from the scripture that was read this morning, we find Jesus telling these very disciples what was about to happen. Listen to what it says in Matthew 20, verses 17 through 19. And this is what we have today. We hear this today. We can proclaim this today. And Jesus, going up to Jerusalem, took the twelve disciples aside along the way and said unto them, Behold, we go up to Jerusalem, and the Son of Man shall be betrayed into the chief priests and unto the scribes, and they shall condemn him to death, and they shall deliver him to the Gentiles to mock, and to scourge, and to crucify him, and the third day he shall rise again. We have the benefit of hindsight, and that certainly sounds pretty clear to me. How about you? We also read in Scripture that they did not comprehend. In Luke 18, verse 34, we read, But the disciples understood none of these things, and the meaning of the statement was hidden from them, and they did not comprehend the things that were said. As we hear this, Maybe we need to ask ourselves, how is it that the truth was hidden from them? Jesus didn't hide the truth. He told them very clearly the Son of Man will die. He, Jesus, would die. The disciples were just not ready to receive these truths, and they found themselves hiding it from themselves. In other words, they didn't want to accept the truth that they were hearing. And we can get pretty puzzled by all this especially when we remember how Jesus already asked the disciples, who do the people say the Son of Man is? And they answer him, saying, some say John the Baptist, others say Elijah, still others, Jeremiah, or one of the prophets. And then Jesus asked the twelve the tough question, the all-important question, the question everyone must ask of themselves. Who do you say I am? Who do we say Jesus is? Peter, brave, bold, and flawed Peter, answers correctly, you are the Messiah, the Son of the living God. Couldn't have been clearer definition of who Jesus was. And yet, they didn't understand. They didn't seem to understand who he truly was, what he was there to do, the nature of his kingdom. They just did not understand. Did he not say, I've come to save what has been lost? Did he not say, I've to die, that prophecy shall be fulfilled? Did he not say that he had come to do what the Father told him to do? Did he not tell them that he and the Father were one and that they could be one with him and the Father if they would believe what he was telling them? He did. He said these things. Jesus was clear. So what was the problem? What is the problem still? Have you ever noticed how when we're holding on to a preconceived notion of something, how difficult it is to consider that topic in any other way? The way we keep falling back to what we have already decided is correct? 
we fall back to the way we want it to be. We might even struggle to put the concept behind us, but any time a situation arises that deals with it, we will habitually fall on what we have accepted in our mind as the proper way to view it. That is exactly what we are seeing here with the disciples. They know that Jesus was sent by God, and yet they don't seem to understand what he is saying. They're looking at it as if they were still slaves in Egypt, with Jesus as the new Moses, leading them out from under their oppressors. This is what they want. They want release from Roman oppression. They are so focused on that that they can't understand that Jesus, being the king of kings, came to save each of them from God's wrath. That's what he's done for us that he came to save the lost. They can't seem to see themselves as lost. He didn't come to relieve them from tyranny. He didn't come to save them from the troubles of this world. And he told them so. And Jesus is still telling the world the very same thing. He tells us, you will have trouble, but take heart, I have overcome the world. He tells us, I didn't come to bring peace, and yet they, we, don't understand. Many today still refuse to accept these truths. They had a preconceived notion of their coming king, their Messiah, their deliverer. He was going to be a warrior king full of worldly strength, and that was how they were to be brought out of worldly oppression. Sure. They saw the miracles Jesus performed. Their ancestors had seen the miracles Moses performed. They knew what God was capable of. What they didn't understand was that God did not want to create a new political state. He wanted his kingdom, an eternal kingdom, to be seen. And that is what he still wants for us today. So here's my challenge for us. Do we have preconceived notions? Are we so comfortable with where we are that we cannot see what Jesus wants from us, wants from each follower? Are we content to receive the word, attending worship once a week? Maybe not even that often? Are we content to say, yes, I'm a Christian, and yet not understand what is required to walk that walk? Because it ain't easy sometimes. Because if we are, then we're no different than those crowds lining the road to Jerusalem, who threw down their robes and palms, shouting Hosanna, glory to God, with no understanding of who he truly is and what he was about to do for them and what he expected of them. We'd be no different. We would be no different because a Christian is someone who radiates their belief. A Christian is someone who shines Jesus' light into the world. A Christian is someone who doesn't worry about whether you hear what he or she says so much as that you see what he or she does. So, are we to be religious Christians like the Jews of Jesus' time, who try to follow the letter of the law but lose sight of its intent? Will we worry more about the mechanics of religion, losing sight of what true faith is? Is that the kind of Christian we will be? If it is, then we've missed the mark. Like the disciples on that first Sunday, we just don't fully understand. We've missed the mark being preoccupied with the religion of Christianity, losing sight of the teachings of Jesus. We've lost sight of the fact that we are Christ's ambassadors to each other and to the world. The disciples wanted Jesus to be the king they expected. And because of that strong desire, were unable to understand. Jesus knew exactly where he was going on that first Palm Sunday. He was going to the cross, and he knew why he was going there. He was going to that cross to save what had been lost. He was going to that cross for me and you. We need to remember 
Jesus never spoke about establishing a religion. He always spoke about saving individual lives through their faith, and he spoke about how they were to act once they were saved. He told us. The Apostle James, Jesus' brother, could not have said it any better. Show me your faith without works, and I will show you faith from my works. We need to hear that again and make it the very core of our Christian walk. Show me your faith without works, and I will show you faith from my works. Our works need to reflect our faith. Works don't save us. They don't save anyone. But they sure do tell the world a whole lot about who we are, what we believe, and who we believe in. And Lord Jesus, may the world see you in each of us. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, thank you for your great love that you have lavished on us that we should be called children of God. Your love for us is sweeter than any other love we could ever know. Help us to share this love willingly and freely with those around us. Amen. Let all who have ears hear. Let us place our hope in him. Let us love our God and Savior. Let every fiber of our being rejoice in him, trusting in his healing name. And Lord, let your love reside in each of your children gathered. For we have our hope and joy in you alone. Amen and amen. Well, thank you again for joining me today. I value your input. And if you need prayer or just someone to talk with, please message me. And may your week be filled to overflowing with the promise Christ Jesus offers. And may you dance before him in that hope. Till we meet again, whether it be here or in heaven above. God bless you.